Welcome to our online worship service here at St. Paul Lutheran Church as we conclude our three-year series of reading through the Bible together as a congregation. Today, we focus our attention upon the Jesus difference from Revelation chapter 20. At the end of this service, I want to encourage you to hang in there with us, stay with us, for a special message from Pastor Kyle, uh, our senior pastor, about plans that are being developed for reopening our church. And now please join me as we begin by asking for our God's presence upon us in worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our first reading for today will also serve as the text for the message in just a little bit. It's taken from Revelation chapter 20, the first 15 verses. There we read these words. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the bottomless pit and a large chain in his hand. He overpowered the serpent, that ancient snake named Devil and Satan. The angel chained up the serpent for a thousand years. He threw it into the bottomless pit. The angel shut and sealed the pit over the serpent to keep it from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were over. After that, it must be set free for a little while. I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were allowed to judge. Then I saw the souls of those whose heads had been cut off because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word. They had not worshipped the beast or its statue and were not branded on their foreheads or hands. They lived and ruled with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were ended. This is the first time that people come back to life. Blessed and holy are those who are included the first time that people come back to life. The second death has no power over them. They will continue to be priests of God and Christ. They will rule with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be freed from his prison. He will go out to deceive Gog and Magog, the nations in the four corners of the earth, and gather them for war. They will be as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashore. I saw that they spread over the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's holy people and the beloved city. Fire came from heaven and burned them up. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of, of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were also thrown. They will be tortured day and night forever and ever. I saw a large white throne and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but no place was found for them. I saw the dead, both important and unimportant people, standing in front of the throne. Books were opened, including the book of life. The dead were judged on the basis of what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead. Death and hell gave up their dead. People were judged based on what they had done. Death and hell were thrown into the fiery lake. The fiery lake is the second death. Those who na whose names were not found in the book of life were thrown into the fiery lake. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading is found recorded in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at verse 20. Words of Jesus. We're told some Greeks were among those who came to worship during the Passover festival. They went to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and told him, Sir, we would like to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew, and they told Jesus. Jesus replied to them, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I can guarantee this truth. A single grain of wheat doesn't produce anything unless it is planted in the ground and dies. If it dies, it will produce a lot of grain. Those who love their lives will destroy them, and those who hate their lives in this world will guard them for everlasting life. Those who serve me must follow me. My servants will be with me wherever I will be. If my people serve me, the Father will honor them. I am too deeply troubled now to know how to express my feelings. Should I say, Father, save me from this time of suffering? No, I came for this time of suffering. Father, give glory to your name. A voice from heaven said, I have given it glory, and I will give it glory again. The crowd standing there heard the voice and said that it had thundered. Others in the crowd said that an angel had talked to him. Jesus replied, that voice wasn't for my benefit, but for yours. This world is being judged now. The ruler of this world will be thrown out now. When I have been lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people toward me. By saying this, he indicated how he was going to die. This is the gospel of the Lord. And now please join me as we profess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Merciful God, thank you for adopting us into your holy family and giving us the power and authority of Jesus himself to ward off the vicious attacks of Satan as he tries to make us fearful and bring us to despair. Teach us that your spiritual protection of us comes by grace through faith in Jesus as we intentionally exercise that faith. Give us wisdom to recognize Satan's temptations and the strength and courage that we need to resist him. Grant us your peace, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord God, we pray for wisdom for the leaders of our nation and the world. As they sort through the incredible volumes of data and the many different recommendations of how to approach the reopening of our economy, please guide them every step of the way. In like manner, we ask you to direct the leaders of our church as they prudently guide us in reopening the public aspects of our church's ministry. Just as there are many different opinions among the citizens of our country on how to reopen our economy, so there are many different ideas about our church. The Apostle Paul talked about the importance of maintaining unity in the spirit through the bond of peace within the church. Even so, please pour out your spirit upon us and grant us such unity and peace as we anxiously look forward to gathering together to worship you as your family here at St. Paul Lutheran Church. O Lord, our great physician, there are many among us who are struggling with injury and disease of body and mind. Through our modern medical community, you work powerfully to bring healing to us. We pray that all of that would come to bear for Todd Novotny as he looks forward to surgery later on this month. Guide the medical team that will care for him. And if it is your will, we pray that you will bless him physically through this procedure and grant him your healing from above. As our nation prepares to celebrate Memorial Day, we want to thank you, Lord, for all of those men and women who have courageously served our nation in our nation's military and have died in order to procure, protect, and preserve our freedom. We especially ask your comfort upon the families who have lost these loved ones. Guard and protect them as they turn to you for strength and courage. God of all comfort, there are many among us who have recently lost loved ones. Specifically, we think of Geraldine Fisher, Bernie Thede, and Elaine Volbrecht, who all passed away during the last week or so. Please comfort their families with your gospel promises. Fill them with the hope of a happy reunion in heaven one day with their loved ones who trusted in Jesus' death and resurrection for them. Our God, who is the author of many, many blessings that we experience in our lives, we thank you today for the 11 years of Christian marriage you have granted to Bill and Dorothy Cole. Please continue to shower your love upon them as they look to Jesus as the great inspiration of how to love one another sacrificially and unconditionally in their marriage. We ask your blessings in the precious name of Jesus our Savior and in the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we dedicate our offerings to the Lord, thanking him for blessing us so generously that we can give well above and beyond the needs of our family in order to support the gospel ministry of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bring these offerings that have been given, these physical offerings, as well as uh, the electronic ones that have been given through our website. We thank you for the ways that you provide for us so generously. Most important, we thank you for the hope that is ours in Jesus and the ministry that you want us involved in in bringing this hope of Jesus to so many people throughout our communities and far beyond. So bless these offerings for the glory of your name and the blessing of many people who need your guidance and direction. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In my 
join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we come before you to meditate upon your word, we ask that you would be with us, that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that you would calm our fears and quiet those disturbances inside of us as we look at the circumstances in the world around us that make us afraid. Pour out your spirit upon us. Guide us and direct us into a deeper living faith in you, the God of our life. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As mentioned before, we're going to focus our attention upon Revelation chapter 20 under the theme, The Jesus Difference. You know, in my memory, it's been a long time since I have seen uh, such a high level of fear in our culture like we see right now presently. World War II was before my time, but from what I read, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty in the world back then at that time, uh, as Hitler and Japan were threatening to militarily take over the world. In our own country, 
There was the Vietnam War era with its daily uh, casualty report on the television news of the number of soldiers that had died over the course of that day. There were the years of the growing buildup in power of the communist Soviet Union and the atomic bomb threat that they posed to our nation and the world. And then briefly, after 9-11, there was this distress we all felt over the potential of the importing of radical Islamic terrorism to our country. All of these threats were very, very real um, and created all kinds of anxiety, but, but all of those enemies had faces and were very tangible. This coronavirus that we're facing right now is quite different, isn't it? This enemy is invisible and kind of spooky because of that. Since we can't see it, there seems to be an even greater level of fear in our culture, perhaps similar to the sort of thing that was present during the polio outbreak of the 1950s or the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918. But what is different now from all of those other experiences our nation and world have been through is that we have been, over the last number of decades, systematically kicking God out of our culture. And that's created an awful lot of problems. You know, in the past, the Christian faith has always helped to keep our culture grounded and hopeful in the midst of great insecurities. But the influence of Christ and his church has been eroding for a long time now. And as the result, people in this country are floundering in spiritual darkness now more than ever and desperately trying to find the anchor that they need to give them hope in the midst of this prevailing crisis. Now contrast our present culture with the one that the Apostle John was writing to near the end of the first century. It was a world of, of great spiritual darkness and desolation. Untold numbers of idols disgraced the streets and the sanctuaries of imperial Rome. One commentator, in fact, says this. The abominations, the filth and corruption attended upon the celebration of pagan festivals, the superstitions, the vices, and so on were truly staggering. Temples and shrines throughout the world were crowded with ignorant, half-despairing worshipers. Only a few scattered Christian churches were present that had been established by Paul and others. For the rest, heathendom was everywhere triumphant. End of quote. And the persecution against those few Christian churches was mounting tremendously. In Rome, for example, the Emperor Nero was arresting and killing Christians, believers in Jesus, in some of the most barbaric ways imaginable. And so, in the midst of all of this chaos and terror, the risen and ascended Savior Jesus gives the Apostle John a vision to write down and send to believers throughout the world to give them hope and courage to, in the words of John, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of everlasting life. The book of Revelation pulls back the curtain uh, on Satan's evil activity so that people could get a sense of the cosmic spiritual battle that was raging for their very souls. The language that's used here is highly symbolic. But in the first three verses of chapter 20, uh, we are told that while evil seems to dominate the cultural scene, our Lord Jesus Christ is still in control and has, in fact, bound or limited the power of the devil by his life, death, and resurrection from the grave. John writes these words. He says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key to the bottomless pit and a large chain in his hand. He overpowered the serpent, that ancient snake named Devil and Satan. The angel chained up the serpent for a thousand years. He threw it into the bottomless pit. The angel shut and sealed the pit over the serpent to keep it from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were over. After that, it must be set free for a little while. Who is this powerful angel, as John calls him? Well, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses, for example, in a burning bush on a mountainside, instructing him to go to Pharaoh in Egypt and demand that he release the children of Israel from their slavery and bondage. It was this same angel of the Lord that then led the people of Israel out of Egypt 
with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Most scholars believe that this Old Testament angel of the Lord was the pre-incarnate Christ. In other words, Jesus before he was incarnate in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Text from Revelation, we are told by John that an angel comes down from heaven in his vision. He binds up Satan with a chain and he throws him into a bottomless pit. Could this be the long-awaited Messiah? Well, after Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, he defeats Satan's temptations for 40 days in the wilderness during his time of prayer and fasting by quoting Scripture to Satan. He then begins his public ministry, and a major feature of his work was driving demons out of people who were possessed by evil spirits. Indeed, the binding or limiting of Satan's power had begun with the coming of Jesus. In fact, Jesus gave the same authority and power to his disciples. On one occasion, Jesus sends out 70 disciples to proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, the word of God. When the 70 come back from their mission, they report to Jesus. We're told this. The 70 disciples came back very happy. They said, Lord, even demons obey us when we use the power and authority of your name. Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And the ultimate binding event was the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. Jesus told his followers shortly before his arrest and crucifixion this. He said, this world is being judged now. The ruler of this world, that would be Satan, will be thrown out now. When I have been lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people toward me. The binding of Satan's power was in dramatic contrast to the vice grip hold the devil had held on humanity throughout the entire Old Testament era. Remember the time of Noah? In Genesis chapter 8 we're told this, the Lord saw how evil humans had become on all the earth. All day long their deepest thoughts were nothing but evil. The Lord was sorry that he had made humans on the earth and he was broken hearted. So he said, I will wipe off the face of the earth these humans that I created. I will wipe out not only humans, but also domestic animals, crawling animals, and birds. I'm sorry that I made them, but the Lord was pleased with Noah. Really? Only one man on the face of the entire planet still loved and worshipped God? Or think of the Old Testament Israelites. God's specially chosen people, a couple of thousand years after the, the time of Noah. Surely they must have been true to the Lord, weren't they? However, at one point we're told that the prophet Elijah was so frustrated with his people that he cried out to God in these words, Lord God of armies, I've eagerly served you. The Israelites have abandoned your promises, torn down your altars, and executed your prophets. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to take my life. The Lord told him, I still have 7,000 people in Israel whose knees have not knelt to worship Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Really? Out of the millions of Israelites that were living on the planet at that time, only 7,000 remained true to God at this point? Satan indeed had the power to deceive the nations, the great masses of humanity during that Old Testament era. But with the coming of Jesus and the binding of Satan, his power is still real and great, but the message of the gospel now holds this power in check. Satan is not able to deceive virtually all of humanity as he did before. Sin has been paid for by the sacrifice of the great Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus himself. And through his resurrection from the grave, our Savior has conquered the power of the devil. He could not hold Jesus in the grave any longer. Satan is defeated. Ah, oh, the, devil, the devil is still a big pain in the butt, just like the coronavirus is for us today right now. But Satan cannot hurt our eternal hope in Jesus, no matter how terrible life gets for us in this world. Listen to John speak about this hope that we have in Christ. I saw thrones, he says, and those who sat on them were allowed to judge. 
Then I saw the souls of those whose heads had been cut off because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word. They had not worshipped the beast or its statue and were not branded on their foreheads or their hands. They lived and ruled with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were ended. This is the first time that people come back to life. Blessed and holy are those who are included the first time that people come back to life. The second death has no power over them. They will continue to be priests of God and Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. Notice what John sees here in this vision. The souls of those who have died physically, but were believers, John says, are alive, and they're ruling with Christ in heaven. This is the first resurrection that occurs. The instant a believer dies physically, at that moment of physical death, the soul of the believer leaves the body and goes to be with God in heaven. Unbelievers are not a part of this first resurrection, John says. In fact, John says that they are not even alive during this period. But he also says that those who are alive who are part of the first resurrection, don't need to be afraid of the second death that will occur for unbelievers when judgment day rolls around. This will be the moment of public judgment when unbelievers will be sent to hell forever. However, on this day, the bodies of believers will be resurrected from the grave, changed somehow into their eternal bodies, and then joined with their souls from heaven, and will then go to be with the Lord forever. The thousand years mentioned here is a symbolic number that simply refers to a long period of time. It is the time of the gospel era that we are currently a part of. When this period of the gospel era comes to an end, John says Satan will be released from his bondage for a brief period of time. A cosmic war will ensue and then Jesus will come on judgment day. Listen to John describe these events. He says, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be freed from his prison. He will go out to deceive Gog and Magog, the nations and the four corners of the earth, and gather them for war. They will be as numerous as the grains on the sand, or of sand on the seashore. I saw that they spread over the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's holy people and the beloved city. Fire came from heaven and burned them up. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were also thrown. They will be tortured day and night forever and ever. I saw a large white throne and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but no place was found for him. I saw the dead, both important and unimportant people, standing in front of the throne, Books were opened, including the book of life. The dead were judged on the basis of what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead. Death and hell gave up their dead. People were judged based on what they had done. Death and hell were thrown into the fiery lake. The fiery lake is the second death. Those whose names were not found in the book of life were thrown into the fiery lake. I know that many of you are feeling very afraid about life right now. There's so much chaos. There's so much evil all around us. There's so much that we can't control. And if you stay focused on all of these scary circumstances, you will continue to feel overwhelmed and fearful. This is what Satan desperately wants you to do. He wants to destroy you with despair. But the remedy for this great fear, his name is Jesus. And he loves you with a passionate, eternal love. He was the remedy for the terror that the Christians were feeling in the Apostle John's day. And he is just as great a remedy for us today. I want to encourage you to try something. When Satan starts tempting you to be afraid, I want you to do three things. Number one, intentionally Direct your thoughts at that time to the cross in the empty tomb of Jesus and remind yourself that you are deeply loved by God. This is so important. Secondly, remind yourself of the promise of Jesus 
from his very own lips as he said, remember that I am always with you until the end of time. He's always there by your side. And then thirdly, this is really important. Tell Satan this. I command you, Satan, by the name and the authority of Jesus Christ who died on the cross and arose from the grave conquering your power. I tell you, in the name of this Jesus who is my Savior and Lord, go away and leave me alone. And he must. The Bible says that we have this authority of Jesus, our Savior. We need to use it when Satan tries to overwhelm us with fear because Jesus makes all the difference in the world for us as Christians. My friends, may God's love for you and Jesus calm your fears and give you hope and security now and forever. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You know, the Apostle Paul told the people of Athens 2,000 years ago, and he speaks to us today. He said, in the past, God overlooked the times when people didn't know any better. But now he commands everyone everywhere to turn to him and change the way they think and act. In other words, repent of their sins. He has set a day when he is going to judge the world with justice. And he will use a man he has appointed to do this. God has given proof to everyone that he will do this by bringing that man back to life. Let us join together confessing our sins to our gracious God. Lord God, we confess to you that we often take for granted the sacrifice of Jesus for us. We take for granted his holy faith that you have given us by your all-powerful grace. Please forgive us for not making growing intentionally in our Christian discipleship and mission activity a high priority. We forget that judgment day is coming and the only thing that will matter will be whether each person has trusted in Jesus for salvation. Forgive us for not witnessing about the importance of faith in Christ to others when we have had the opportunity. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Peter gives us some wonderful words of hope and healing in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, Christ suffered for our sins once. He was an innocent person, but he suffered for guilty people like you and me so that he could bring you to God. Based upon this important truth, it is my privilege to share with all of you who have confessed your sins and are trusting in Jesus as your Savior. You are forgiven of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.
thank you for joining us for worship today. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And remember, the power of Jesus is available to ward off all of those temptations of Satan to be afraid of all kinds of circumstances in your life. God wants you to find his peace. God bless. I want to thank you for staying with us all the way to the end of the video today. Uh, I have an important announcement for you on restarting public worship here at St. Paul Lutheran Church. You know, after careful consideration, we are preparing to restart worship services. Our survey indicated that while there are varying opinions on the topic, people do want to return to worship. Luther's explanation to the fifth commandment reminds us of our duty to protect our neighbor. It says, we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. We may have varying opinions, but we all have the same needs. And that's to come and to hear the good news of Jesus, to receive the forgiveness of our sins, and to receive God's gifts of body and blood shed for us. And so the reopening team has been working to find a happy medium amongst the opinions while protecting everyone coming to worship. We ask that everyone respect each other's opinions as our goal is to be able to, say, is to safely worship together again. And so I'm going to go through this checklist with you. This is our initial plan as follows. And please keep in mind that adjustments will be likely made as these phases go on one way or the other. Uh, and so here's the opening plan. Uh, worshiping, uh, worship services will be limited to 100 people per service. Uh, you're going to have to sign up in advance. We will have a sign up online, or you can sign up by calling the church office. Uh, services will be Thursday at 6.30, Sundays at 8 a.m. and at 10 a.m. We ask that you attend one service per month until we can determine what attendance uh, needs will be at the very onset mass will be mandatory and we encourage you if you own your own mass we ask that you bring it we will have extras available uh, here at church uh, continuous communion will be held at all services with individual cup only everyone will be asked to use hand sanitizer upon entering the building and we will be using every other pew with pews clearly marked as to where to sit uh, so, social distancing of six feet will be used. Uh, households will be able to sit together. Uh, if you or your some, someone in your household is not feeling well, um, if you have a fever or a cough, uh, we ask for the, your safety and for the safety of others uh, that you do not attend service at this time. Uh, wor worship services will be live streamed on Thursdays at 6.30 with the recording available anytime after that service. Uh, and that'll be, like I said, Thursday at 6.30. There will be limited access to the rest of the building. And so the intention is that if you're coming to worship, you enter in the doors, you come into the sanctuary, you find a seat. Uh, now is not really the time for fellowship. Uh, we're here to receive God's gifts. And I know that that's, that hurts many people I know there's the want for social, uh, but right now we're focused on getting you uh, into God's house to receive his word and his gifts. Uh, we ask that you refrain from fellowship at this time. Uh, paper bulletins will not be used. Everything will be on the screens, and the nursery will not be available at this time. It is our intention for worship to begin Thursday, June 4th. And sign up for those services will begin on Friday, May 29th at 9 a.m., either online through our website or, as I said before, by calling the church office uh, during business hours. Uh, Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 4.30, Friday, 8.30 to noon. The church office will begin uh, to be open to the public uh, May, uh, Monday, June 1st. And uh, this comes from our reopening task force. Uh, and so... Uh, we hope and pray uh, that right now uh, we have put in the safety precautions uh, and that we can come together again uh, to hear God's words, uh, to hear the truth of, of Jesus 
life, death, and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins, that we can receive God's gifts. Uh, and so we pray right now that this would be uh, a starting point for us and that we could uh, get back to a normal, uh, a somewhat normal routine shortly. Uh, God's blessings to you. Thank you for your continued thoughts and prayers as uh, we've gone through this endeavor. Uh, please know that uh, this has been an ongoing process. Much thought and time and preparation has gone into preparing to open for service. I uh, thank you again for your thoughts and prayers. Uh, God's blessings to you. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend. God bless.